Hello and welcome to today's uh, panel discussion. Our topic is uh, investments in blockchain uh, investments in blockchain gaming. I am Bila Pandya with Forte Labs Inc. I shall be your uh, moderator. Gaming is one of the fastest growing industries right now and blockchain provides a set of possibilities with uh, through open and, tr and trusting environment. The uh, virtual and digital currencies both are backed by funding. The murky waters of traditional financing are daunting enough. And now we are in the uncharted territory of blockchain gaming. To help us navigate uh, to this nuances and simplify the process, we have two esteemed panelists with us today. Uh, I'll introduce them and I will read their bios really quick so that I don't miss out on their very vast and interesting experience. Our first guest today is Brad Gibson. He is currently a partner at Initialized. He has co-founded Drawyer, a browser uh, drawing startup. Uh, he has also successfully sold two of his block platforms to Twitter, and he has founded uh, VC SO8, a patch sling set, a, a, commu a block community site. He is currently as an operating partner with Initialized. Uh, helps portfolio companies to build really strong teams as well as a strong software. Welcome, Pratt. We Our second guest is uh, Alexis Bonte. He is currently a group COO with Stillfront, and he is focused on operations as well as he co-leads game, game studios with his group uh, CEO. He also supports uh, the firm's uh, M&A and strategy. Uh, Alexis ha was uh, previously a CEO of uh, ED Public Labs, which is now currently part of Stillfront. And uh, as a Atomic VC, he has uh, he has sourced investments in Spain and France in gaming as well as in consumer verticals, and he supports portfolio companies to accelerate growth. Uh, he is also on the board of uh, OPB as well as uh, Tezo Foundation. Welcome, Alexis. Both of you have a very similar trajectory in the sense that uh, you, know, you have been entrepreneurs, you have your own successful startups, incubated them, had a successful exits, and now into the entrepreneurs, venture capitalists. Alexis, walk me and describe me your journey. Founder, operator, investor. Yeah, no, thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Bella. It was, uh, it was very kind. Um, no, I mean, I think it's just a natural course of things. You know, uh, when I first started, uh, you know, my first startup, I think, was in 1998, you know, with the first internet wave. Um, I tried to do eBay in Europe. Uh, it was called TradeOK.com. It was a miserable failure. I knew nothing. Uh, you know, I, don't, I didn't know how to set up a tech team. I didn't know how to lead projects. I didn't know how to raise funds. Uh, it was. I call it my accelerated MBA. It was probably about the same cost as an MBA, so it was fine. Um, and and then I was very lucky to join a, a company called LastMed.com, which was one of the first kind of you know big internet startups. You know, last company to do IPO before the bubble burst. Uh, then you know, uh, and, and so so you learned a lot of things as you go as you go. And then, you know, with lastminute.com being one of the very few, you know, one of the first internet unicorns in Europe with a $1.1 billion exit, you know, I was able to choose whatever I wanted to do. My childhood dream was always to do video games. Uh, and so that's what I started to do. And also, as I was doing that, that's when I started doing some angel investing. And uh, just naturally, just, you know, different people, you know, uh, that you meet. And of course, I had no idea how to do it properly. I had no idea how to do a, you know, the kind, what you need to do have in, to have in a term sheet. I didn't know anything about portfolio approach. I put too much money in one company, then didn't have enough money for the other companies. So all of those, you know, kind of basic mistakes, uh, which means that when I had my second exit with the Republic Labs, um, you know, I decided to have a much more, how should I say it, uh, you know, pragmatic and professional approach to my investing. Um, you know, that's why I joined, you know, Atomico as a venture partner to understand how it's properly done and started doing, you know, kind of angel investing in the proper way and all that. So I think it's something that you learn, basically. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, probably being an entrepreneur is something that you have in yourself or you don't, and then you just make it happen. And uh, being an investor is something that uh, it's an acquired taste, an acquired passion and something that you learn. 
Thanks, Alexis. Uh, Brett, I'm really fascinated. You actually graduated in philosophy and from philosophy to founder to now an investor. I'm all ears. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, no. So my philosophy degree wasn't that terribly monetizable in the marketplace. So I ended up <laughs> kind of working at, at a pizza place and uh, I d didn't think that was you know, long-term where I wanted to be. So I taught myself to program and um, luckily I, I was lucky enough to have a friend who worked at a, at a San Francisco based startup and they were willing to take a risk on me uh, based on his recommendation. So, and then from there, I just, uh, I think I, I moved from just engineer at a company to, to founder because I didn't really want to have a boss for, for at first. And so I spent most of my career, you know, writing code in, in a, you know, founding or CTO role, role at, at, at small startups. Um, and one of the one of which you mentioned is Posterous, which ended up, you know, being acquired by Twitter. Absolutely, um, yeah. And then, uh, and then I guess, you know, the path to VC was pretty fortuitous too. I think um, my, my co-founder at Posterous was Gary, Gary Tan, who founded Initialized mm -hmm. Capital. And um, so I, I, I guess I say that I ended up at VC just by virtue of knowing Gary. Um, I, he was working at Y Combinator um, and I joined him there and wrote, and wrote some more software, kind of all the internal software systems. And then when we both left, um, he went on to, you know, raise a larger fund three for initialized and, and soon after I, I followed him again and, and joined. Um, so, you know, we're, you know, we're an early stage kind of generalist venture capital firm. We invest, um, you know, across many, most and mostly in, in software-based startups, and and we're pretty interested in in and engaged in in the crypt, in crypto. So. Mm. Yeah, that brings me to my next question: Why blockchain? What got you into the blockchain space, Brett? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean it's everyone's got like kind of the rabbit hole thing uh, story. So. Um, you know, I guess the first time I ever, you know, bought any of the assets is because um, you know, as, a, as, a, as a founder who was previously funded by Y Combinator, I was willing just to try out other YC startups and one of them happened to be Coinbase. So I thought, hey, you know, I'll support these guys. Um, uh, and then actually Gary and I, when, uh, when, when Twitter ended up shutting down Posture, so we started a new, mm -hmm. a new project called Post Haven to put, to maintain all of the, um, our old customers blogs online and our promises to keep it on online indefinitely to the extent, you know, we're, we're able to affect that. So, um, as part of that, you know, we, we did a bunch of deep research and Gary, you know, had me look like, can we host this, you know, in some sort of decentralized way? Um, and this was, this is before I joined this size in, in around 2016. And at the time, I think there was an emphatic no, the technologies are not ready, but there's something here. Um, and, and there's definitely something to this ecosystem um, that, I, that I find interesting. And, and so when I joined Initialize, you know, um, you know, I was kind of the, kind of the lead on reading white papers and, and, and sort of took over crypto for the firm. Got it. Thanks. Uh, Alexis, uh, tell me, how do you feel about blockchain gaming? What are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I got into blockchain through gaming. Um, and the reason I got into, into it through gaming was really when um, the first game that we designed, we we're only a very small team. We know we were a team of mm -hmm. six people back in 2007. And we did this game called eRepublic.com, which was a virtual version of the real world on browser. You know, we kind of a whole in-game economy. You could create your own company. Uh, you can you could r run for politics. You could do all these sort of things. I, w I wanted to do like a civilization with real people on the internet. Uh, if, if for people out there were players, uh, it's a miracle the game is still working and there's still lots of people playing it because it was really poorly designed. But it did kind of um, you know make me think about virtual economies and how they work and, you know, and virtual assets and how can you, because, you know, people, you know, there's players in the Republic.com, you know, they've been playing for 12, 13, 15 years every day. You know, it's, it's a major investment and they really create something. So when I saw the first kind of um, blockchain initiatives and blockchain efforts and all this sort of stuff, you know, I, you know, I, I just naturally got interested. And then, and then there's two fun, you know, there's two funny stories there. So obviously, like everybody, you know, I bought some Bitcoin, in, you know, early mm -hmm. on when it was quite difficult to buy, completely mm -hmm. forgot about it. 
Uh, and then I met the central banker of a fairly large European country, and I'm not going to name who he is. And he said that all these savings <laughs> were in Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I should probably look and find out where I left those Bitcoins. And then, hmm. and then I just got back into it uh, through that. Uh, and then obviously, when I joined Atomico, one of, the, uh, one of the, the things I said I wanted to look at was uh, to basically look at um, you know what's, what was happening with crypto, what was happening with blockchain economy, and kind of look what was out there. And also now through Stillfront, uh, you know we have 14 studios now, you know 35, you know large, you know large, large games. Uh, we're a fairly large company now, you know practically three billion market, three billion dollars market cap. So obviously, you know we're very interested, you know, being a free-to-play, um, you know, um, games company in what's happening, what's you know what's coming next. And, and I do think that, that there, there's interesting, we're still very early, but there's interesting things coming from, uh, from blockchain gaming. Got it, thanks. Uh, Brett, can you uh, help us understand, because right now uh, everybody, we see enthusiasm in the blockchain, but we do see that the adoption and the scaling, all of that is yet to come. So we see investors being hesitant to go into the blockchain space. So can you explain to us what is it that you, you, you as an investor look for in a blockchain project? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, I definitely, I understand some of that hesitancy. And I think that, um, I think that, you know, what, I think we're still largely in an infrastructure phase for, mm -hmm. for a lot of what's going on in the blockchain space. And, um, and user facing applications, you know, we're going to need to build out infrastructure such that they're not, you know, it's not just an abstraction that they're on a blockchain. Um, it actually is providing some sort of meaningful value. And, and so, so, I mean, for us, I mean, I think, you know, things that, that are building out, you know, infrastructure and or have a, a path to sort of near term revenue models or, or what we're most interested in, I think. Um, there's a lot of risk in the industry around building, building on top of a, a platform that is itself moving, which introduces this kind of external path dependency, which is a mm -hmm. very hard thing for a startup to navigate and especially to reason about on what, what kind of timeline they'll be able to get you know, their product to market and working. Good. Thank you. And uh, Alexis, for you, what do you look for as a vision of a project into the blockchain gaming? What are the that you want to see in that project as an investor? Yeah, so, so for me, and you know, I, I kind of shared the story that um, after my first few you know, blockchain meetings uh, at Atomico, you know, usually my, uh, you know, my, 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 my kind of scouting meetings with new companies you know, used to be you know, between half an hour and an hour, and the blockchain meeting was always a joke that you know, it was like 15 minutes slot because uh, very often after the first five minutes, I knew I was not interested because one of the first questions I would always ask is why does this need to be on the blockchain? And 95% mm -hmm. of the time mm -hmm. I couldn't get a good answer. So big save, big saving of time. Uh, but, um, but, but to be, but with, you know, with, for every nine, you know, um, either crazy scientists or, you know, crazy, you know, uh, gold, uh, gold, you know, kind of, you know, uh, gold rush mentality type of person, you would get one really smart, uh, mm -hmm. an interesting team that knew what they were doing. Um, but to me, the, the, the kind of key element that I always look for and that most of the time was missing was I'm looking for solutions that, first of all, you know, that, that you look at it from the user perspective, uh, that really make it completely seamless for the user. The, the user doesn't care whether he's on blockchain or, uh, or not. You know, he wants to be on something that just works and what is this giving me and that just gives him something extra. So, so I look at, um, you know, is it seamless for the user? Does it bring, uh, you know, additional, you know, revenues or engagement or something for the game uh, or the, the game platform or the service? It doesn't have to be to, 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 to be a game. Um, and does it do it in a way that can truly scale and can you do it in a way where you're starting with a large base from the beginning? You know, uh, in blockchain gaming, you know, uh, when I ask the typical questions, okay, how many, 
DAU do you have, you know, and because they say, oh, we make all this <laughs> revenue. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, it's just it's just people, you know, passing on their Ethereum to other people. Uh, and you've got 50 people doing that. So, so yeah, I'm looking for I'm looking for something that can have true scale, true critical mass. And it's hard to find because, as Brett said, we're still in the infrastructure side uh, and uh, phase. And as long as people will have to use things like MetaMask or, or things like that, this is not going to scale. Mm. So, so if I'm I'm a I'm that one of the the crazy ones who really wants, who's really passionate about blockchain and wants to build this game. At what point in time should I come to the VC ask for a funding? Like, what is it? What is the right time for me to come and ask for a funding? Uh, Alexis? Yeah, I think it really depends on what kind of VC you're talking about. I think if you're uh, speaking with Brad and you're looking for Series A and Series B, you know, you, prob you, you better have a product that is starting to scale that you can help accelerate. Uh, if you are looking at, you know, people are looking maybe at angel investing like myself, then, you know, I can probably come in a bit earlier. And, uh, you know, and if you have a really strong concept and early prototype and, uh, and I feel you're in the right direction, then, then I would definitely look at it and, you know, and, and show it to other people that are interested in, in doing that kind of earlier, uh, earlier, you know, pre-seed uh, investment mm -hmm. type, uh, type risk. Uh, but okay. Uh, Brett, you, you're the more you're the yeah. more active VC, so I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> yeah, Brett, what what time should we come to you? Like as a founder, somebody is there in that situation. When should they come to the VC for funding? Yeah, I mean, so I guess so. There, I mean, there's a few points there. One is, I mean, as uh, initialized, we don't actually do a, a lot of, of specific game funding, you know, and so we we are believers in 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 gaming as a space. Um, just you know, for from a high levels aspect standpoint, we think that you know asset ownership and gaming is meaningful, and blockchain actually puts teeth to that in a way that eventually users are going to care about. And so, you know, we've done get, we've done investments in in the blockchain gaming space, primarily in Horizon blockchain games. We're building out a platform, you know, to for asset ownership along with Skyweaver Game to, you know, to exercise the platform they're building. So I say that to say that, you know, we're not experts in milestones for, for game, you know, game investment. Um, it's a slightly different lens. Um, and I think it, 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 I think certainly, you know, at the series A through series B level, it, it aligns a lot with Alexis's saying, you know, it's very metrics driven, very much about, you know, DAUs and how much you're monetizing those people, what your cost of acquisition is. Um, so, uh, I mean, on the infrastructure side, I think we're willing to invest a little earlier because we think that, you know, building out a platform that can host mm -hmm. multiple games, um, you know, is a slightly different business model. Um, but, yeah. yeah and, and sorry, if I could just quick, quickly add something Absolutely. very quickly. Yes. And another angle, obviously, since I'm on the board of the Tezos Foundation, you know, if you, uh, if you come to me from an angle where, you know, you can really do something special, you know, with the Tesos blockchain protocol, then I'll, I'll always be interested in, uh, in looking at it. Yeah. And I, w I would say like, certainly Alex, you know, people do like Alexis who are doing the er very early stage, you know, or have so the sensibilities around what makes a good game. And I'm, you know, I'm more yeah. of a technical person. I, I, I don't claim, I don't claim to be able to sort of pick out the magic too early on. No, that's true. And that really brings me to a good point, Alexis, uh, that uh, in case of blockchain, what other opportunities are there for a uh, for the uh, founders to access to any additional fundraise and additional funding opportunities? So one of the things mm -hmm. definitely you talked about was Tezos. Uh, any other spec, any other area, something else you can comment on both Brad and Alexis? So that would be really because one of the things definitely is the traditional route, but Blockchain also opens up other opportunities for uh, founders to get funding. Yeah, well, I know, I know that you know the guys at Forte. You know, they have this, um, they have this program that helps um, that helps emerging game studios or or existing game studios. You know, um, you know, go into uh, go into blockchain. So I think I think that's one way. Um, Tesos and other protocols, you know, will often support you if you're going to use um, their protocol to do something. So that's another mm -hmm. way. 
but you should not rely only on that. That's my that's mm-hmm. my, my, my my main advice. Uh, there's a lot of grant hunters out there, and that's not a business model uh, to to build something. Um, and then you know, look at um, look at you know who's been already investing in in blockchain. You know, uh, a lot of people know that I've invested in the Sandbox project and many others. And uh, usually, you know, we will know other people that are interested in the space. And and if you convince one of us to uh, to look at this uh, carefully, then uh, more more likely you you can get others. Got it, Brad. Any recommendation of uh, avenues? You are you are also into blockchain infrastructure, definitely. Uh, if you can throw some light on that aspect too. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I guess I would echo a lot of what Alexa said there. Like the the the, the layer, all these layer ones are are hungry for usage and hungry for people building on top of them. So you know, if you have something meaningful to bring to the table, I think that games are certainly within their purview for all their grant programs. Um, that you know, that's not a sustainable uh, funding mechanism, but it could help you get your start. Um, I think that you know. I think I you know. I think the hope is that um, some of these, some you know, w- as infrastructure matures, some of these systems will will make the games a little bit easier to to monetize. I mean, game. I'm not an expert in game monetization, as perhaps Alexis is. So it's probably a, a, a complex and um, slightly hand wavy topic there. Um, and then, and I I don't know. I think. Um, it's it is a hard moment because people that are more or used to funding more traditional games are looking for things that match what they're used to funding, right? So they're not they're not um, willing just to suspend disbelief about the metrics they're looking for because blockchain. Um, so, you know, I, I think for I think for in the, in the near term, um, more of the kind of independent developers kind of early funding is going to come from the the crypto community. Got it. And and I think that's what we have also been seeing that it definitely is echoing to what, what you are saying, Brad. So uh so on, on, on that note, if uh, since both of you have been uh you know uh, entrepreneurs and into the VC, what are and not necessarily just in gaming, but generally, what are the pitfalls as a founder that I should be wary of? What would you caution them initially when I start off with this? Right. You know, I mean, I mean, there's a lot. I, mean, I guess the funny thing about startups is there's there's a lot of ways to die, right? And and, and maybe and, and and perhaps you know it's been said that perhaps like the way to the way to succeed is just avoid kind of all of them. I think one thing that you know early on, um, you know, my my one of my first startups links that was was kind of not 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 doing super great. We were. We were fundraising around the time that you know the 2008 while well, the markets were collapsing, and uh, I think you know I think one thing that I that comes to mind I sort of remember is that it was um, there there's there's often sometimes as a, as a founder a morale gap you can fall into where you s- start to think maybe you don't have more options, and there's always kind of something you can do. I think we had this weird blind spot. Um, around that and there's all there's always you know more doors you knock on and more things you can try um, it has to be balanced against um, you know going too deep on on pursuing an idea that's sort of a dead end but you know just kind of kind of kind of keeping keeping your mind open um, to to resourcefulness is I think an important important founder trait yeah. thanks thanks for that Alexis yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll second everything that Brett said. And I mean, in terms of listing the pitfalls, there's just so many of them that I'm not even going to try listing the number of pitfalls. Uh, I think if there's one thing, and it's a bit of a cliche, but I could say uh, is it's very easy, I think, you know, to be either overconfident or underconfident in how things mm-hmm. are going uh, because it's a very emotional ride, you know, uh, I kind of compared the adventure of being an entrepreneur in a startup like a Rocky Balboa movie, except you only get to do the first scene where the guy is just punching your face all the time. And then all of a sudden, you know, after 12 rounds, you're still standing and you don't understand how you won, right, uh, somehow. So it's, it's, it's really, really hard. Uh, but the, I think the key thing I've learned is um, it's really about who, who are the people that you surround yourself with and just how strong they are. And, um, and so... So the key thing is really hire very slowly 
and fire very quickly. <laughs> I think that's a key thing uh, because it's really about who's making the journey with you and you're going to make mistakes. Uh, so minimize the number of mistakes that you make in terms of the people that are on your team. And if you've made a mistake, correct it very, very quickly. Got it. And, and, that, and that's, that's, that's really very helpful advice from the two of you. So thank you. Uh, 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 one more thing is that uh, when you talk about scaling, you know, one of the things that definitely resonates is like, hey, when I want to scale, I've started a startup. I have now want to be into the scaling mode. Uh, what is, how should the gears be shifted from, from, the, from the CEO perspective? Alexis? Yeah, so I think the first temptation that I always see, and I'll see everybody make the same mistake, and I made the mistake, is again, when you start seeing everything's going well, and you want to scale, and if you're VC back, you know, your VCs, they are not interested in the three, four times return, they're interested in the 10 times return, sorry, yeah. Brett, uh, uh, minimum. Uh, so they're like pushing you, they're saying, oh, you're profitable, we don't care about this, just spend everything you have, growth, 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 growth. And then you start, hiring many people, you start launching lots of new projects and you lose sight of what made you successful in the beginning because you lose focus. So mm -hmm. I think the, the number one mistake that everybody makes when they're scaling is they don't realize that they just need to continue doing exactly the same thing that got them to that place and be very pragmatic and do baby steps and be re relentless about keeping the focus and just hiring very slowly just the key people that make them do a qualitative jump. Uh, that's what you do. And most people, what they do is they take a bit, almost a machine gun approach. They hire, you know, very, a lot of people very quickly. They launch these new projects and it's ends in tears after two. It looks good for a year. Two years afterwards, they've got to downsize, fire half the people and start again. That's kind of, this is what I see 90% of the time. Got it. Uh, uh uh, Brett, in your case, when you work with the portfolio and help them build strong teams and strong, what is what? How how do you proceed with that? What is your take on it? Um, you know, the thing one thing that comes to mind is um, what, I think a lot of a lot of builders, especially and technical people, have mm -hmm. trouble letting go of their role as an individual contributor on their team as they grow, and they they wait too long to to uh, to sort of internalize the notion that their output is now that of their team and that they can't kind of personally take over things and that they simply cannot grow the organization unless they find people they, they trust to, to run the different departments of, of, of their startup. And that, I mean, and that kind of, you know, dovetails back to what Alexis was saying about slowly, you know, hire slowly the best people because you really, part of that is hiring. You, you, need, you need to hire people that you, you know, you feel like they can do the job better than you, right? So, um, or, or otherwise you're just gonna be in their hair and you're not gonna let go and you're not going to be able to grow an organization past a, a certain level. Got it. I think that's a super yes. point from Brad. Sorry, I'm gonna mm -hmm. just, 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 just build on that. It's, I think the key thing is how do you as a founder scale alongside your organization? And the only way to do that is to get out of the way, hire better people, they take your place, and you're basically reinventing your job as you scale. And I think that's a great point that Brett, Brett made. And things start working when you're able to do that. Hmm. Absolutely. And, and those, are, those are really good factors to think. So now thinking that we, we are in the pandemic right now and what's going around, uh, how is that enabling, disenabling the innovation, invention, and how would it impact blockchain? More adoption, less adoption? Right? Yeah, I, 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 I guess I don't have a super clear picture. I mean, certainly we've seen a lot of companies with, uh, with a lot of people with a lot of time at home that have been pretty productive in, in, in turning out code and the like um I, in, in terms of specific application use cases of blockchain it's it's not super clear to me i think you know there's always been this kind of narrative around um you know like uh management of of, of supply chain um mm -hmm. and, and through the blockchain and i think i think some of the the crypto cryptographic primitives kind of lend themselves well but still it hasn't really played out in practice too much i think um I, th I think that the current situation is kind of moving maybe too fast for this industry to be stepping in. Okay. Alexis, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I think some of the, um, you know, the kind of decentralized um, approach, decentralized organization uh, approach that, you know, that, that, that is key to key to blockchain, I think is, is, is going to resonate with a lot more people going mm -hmm. forward, because we've literally all become decentralized organizations, we're all, you know, working <laughs> from home. Uh, so, so I think more people are going to start uh, thinking differently. Uh, so uh, maybe there's a, a different approach in, 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 in the philosophy of, 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 how, of how we do things that might accelerate things a little bit, but, uh, but in, in the end, it takes, it takes the right infrastructure to be in place and, and, and there's still work to do, be done there. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, definitely. There's certainly uh, the, the, mistrust, the increased mistrust of government um, does bring some more philosophical alignment with, with some of the principles of the mm. blockchain space. Mm. Uh, so one question was uh, this, uh, what, what, what would you have somebody told you 10 years ago? What would that be? Do you have any comments on that? If somebody would have to say something to you 10 years ago, what would that have been? It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be really, really, really tough, but it will be okay in the end, and the journey will be worth it. Okay. Uh, Brett? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it was actually back to the point I was kind of making earlier, but I think if they were to phrase it, it's, it's keep trying. You're gonna, you'll figure it out. You, you know, don't mm -hmm. throw in the towel. You, you have more options. Keep Think it through. Mm -hmm. uh, buy, buy Bitcoin would have been helpful. As well. <laughs> yes, that would have been a lovely, lovely advice. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, so any, any any other advice recommendation you have for those uh, enthusiastic <laughs> who are into blockchain gaming and want to continue and you know push forward any any piece of uh, recommendation and advice Brett I mean I think I mean I, so I think at a high level what 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 is inspiring it, uh, you know, all of the sort of UX problems and the the ability, you know, the the gaps um, that, that make it hard for, for a more mainstream objects to use blockchain systems. Um, for all that, it's, it's still a space with a bunch of extremely engaged, extremely talented people. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm very hesitant to bet against that. So, you know, if you're, if you're energized and into building stuff and, and you've got a great idea for a game, you know, don't, you know, the, and you're surrounded by other talented people, like just, just go for it. I think, I, I think, you know, I think the industry is, is figuring the things out one by one and um, you know, you should, you should follow what resonates with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, on my end, I think it's in, in the same line is kind of, I think all of today's struggles that you're facing and all of the things that you're learning, you know, uh, you know, it's, it, they will pay, they will pay uh, later in the day when, you know, you will basically know what everyone else doesn't know uh, about this space. So uh, it might be tough right now, but, you know, in, you know, internet was very tough, you know, uh, in 2001, 2002, after the bubble burst and, uh, and the people that stuck with it and, uh, you know, did very well. Uh, so uh, this is, it's in, it's in moments like this that, you know, great companies are built uh and great things are done so um so just stick with it got it um, any other last minute thoughts anything else that you would want to add to our uh, viewers our people attendees at the conference brett or alexis i don't think so no i'm good enjoy it okay okay uh so i thank uh, both of you for your time today today and uh, giving us this excellent opportunity to get some insights uh, from your end and I thank uh, San Francisco Blockchain Week to give us this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks you. A lot. That's great.